All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, I've already preached on the Lord's Supper, which is the latter half of this chapter. So I'm not even, we're not even going to go over that tonight. I just did this on Sunday morning, and I went really far in depth on it. And um, I'm not going to go do that again. Actually, I did it last Wednesday. So last Wednesday when we did the Lord's Supper, no, it was a Sunday before, that's right, it was two Sundays ago. It wasn't just this last Sunday, it was the Sunday before. I, I went through basically verse by verse of, of this whole latter portion because I was teaching on the Lord's Supper. So we're not going to do that tonight, but that's okay because there's plenty to look at on the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to start off, let's look at verse 1 again. We just read the whole chapter, we're going to go back to verse 1. Verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. What I take out of this right off the bat, we can see here the Apostle Paul is admonishing the church at Corinth for them to follow him. He said, look, be a follower of me. Now, you hear this all the time. People will criticize you, especially now with, with sermons being posted online and you can hear you know, different pastors that are preaching and stuff. And, and people will be like, oh, yeah, you're just following a man. Oh, you're just following a man. Well, you know what? The church at Corinth was following a man too. At least if they were doing what the Scripture told them to do. Because don't forget, this, uh, this epistle of Paul written to the Corinthians, it's not just Paul's opinion. This is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. So when he says in verse number 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, there's nothing wrong for them to follow Paul. The key, though, is found in the latter part of that verse. Even as I also am of Christ. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So the way that the Apostle Paul is following Christ, he's giving them an example for them to follow. So the, 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 the key is just to make sure that whenever there's a leader, someone who's leading the way starts to not follow Christ in whatever area, because everyone's a sinner. Not any man, any one man is perfect in everything that they do. Those are the areas, okay, well, I'm not going to follow you in that area. But the overall concept isn't just, oh, well, because no man's perfect, don't follow any man. That's not true. And people will criticize you. Oh, man, you follow this man or that man. You're just, you're just some follower. You can't think for yourself. I've heard this so many times, especially in the previous church at, uh, at Faithful Word Baptist. When I was going to church there, people will just basically just um, insult you into thinking that you don't have a... Just because you're following someone else and you're learning from a teacher, you're learning from someone who is very well-versed in the Bible... It doesn't mean that you don't think for yourself. Say, no, actually, I've been to many churches, and this is the one where I found the truth was actually being taught. And I recognize that. And you know what? I was following a man that was leaving, leading a good example. I can see that. I've been to other churches where the pastor would say one thing and then go and do another. That's not a good example. That's not someone that I want to follow. Because that is not following Christ. That's just that's being a Pharisee or a hypocrite saying one thing and not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So if you're going to follow somebody, be a follower, be a follower of the Apostle Paul. Hey, he was doing what he was preaching. He was living the life. He was living the way he was supposed to be doing and preaching the gospel every, every creature and going out and traveling all over the world to preach the gospel of Christ, get churches started, help people get, get uh, discipled and trained up in the right way. That is a good example to follow. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, you have to turn there, that God has given us pastors and apostles and deacons, you know, all these different people for the perfecting of the saints. So God has, has instituted, first of all, the organization or the structure of the church, the local church, to assemble together with other believers. And he's also ordained positions within the church of leadership, of a man that's going to teach the Bible, and someone that ought to be a person that you can follow as a good leader. Don't ever be deceived by these people who want to say, oh, you, you're just following a man and try, to, and try to insult you into saying, oh, I don't just follow, you know, look, I follow a man and I, I followed a man. Now I am the leader of this church. 
And I'm trying to be the best leader I can so that you can look to me and say, hey, I'm going to be a follower of Pastor Burson's as he follows Christ. And lead by example. It's not just found in this one verse. Turn, if you would, over to keep your place here because obviously we're going to be coming back here. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. This, this concept of being able to follow a man, follow a leader, is all throughout the Bible. I mean, look at Moses. Who was Mo? Moses was a leader. And the people were supposed to follow him. He led them out of Egypt. Now what happened? Oh, I'm not going to follow that man. What are you going to do? You're going to stay in Egypt? Of course you're going to follow him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word, excuse me, in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Again, and, and the key is, and it's reiterated over and over again, ye became followers of us and of the Lord. And in verse 5, ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes, saying that I don't expect you, don't just follow a leader because they're a pastor of a church. You need to follow them as they follow Christ. As here, you became followers of us and of the Lord. Because they were following the good example that was set forth by those leaders, by the Apostle Paul, by the disciples, by whoever, right? So there's nothing wrong with following man. And I'm not saying this because, oh, I just want the glory of everybody following me. No, I want you to follow me in the way that I am following Christ. And only in that way. I don't expect you to follow me when I'm serving other things and just, you know, now all of a sudden I've got these followers. All right, go to my house. I've got a lot of work to be done. No, that's not, that's not the point at all. I mean, and look, it, there are people like that. There are cult leaders. There are people that, that they care just about the glory unto themselves and being able to lead and deceive people for their own gain, for their own financial gain, or for their own twisted perverted thoughts or whatever, like, you know, the Jonestown and, and all the other, you know, it's real. It, and people will look at that and then go way off the other direction. Well, you can't follow a man. No, the Bible says it's okay to follow a man, but just make sure that you're following men as they follow Christ. Now, how are you going to know if a man is following Christ or not, though? And this is the key because I've mentioned this already. I mentioned this on Sunday. The, the responsibility falls on you to know if the pastor or leader or whoever is following Christ. And the only way that you can know that is getting in this book for yourself. Don't just be spoon-fed here at church. Church is important. I hope you learn a lot. That's what the, one of the points of having church is for you to learn a lot more. But the main source of your learning ought to be at home in this book. That is your responsibility to do that. You need to be able to discern whether or not a man is following Christ. And hey, use that example. If you've got a good man to follow, amen. Praise the Lord for that. You can learn, and, and there's a lot of things that I've learned from men. A lot of people don't realize you could, you could read and understand some of the scripture. You could look at things like, you know, Christ sent them out two and two. They go soul winning and preaching the gospel. But you don't necessarily really know how to do that until you've got someone to show you the way. Hey, come with me out soul winning. Come, come, come see the way that we present the gospel. And it's, it's just like a light goes on. This is right. Yeah, what, you know, this it lines up with everything I've read in the Bible. When you actually go out and do it, hey, follow the example that's being set forth by a godly man, someone else who's already following Christ. Philippians 3, also the same thing. You don't have to turn if you don't want to. You could turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll just read this from Philippians 3, verse 17. The Bible reads, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. 
For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is at their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. He's saying, look and pay very close attention to the way that we are leading and serving God and the life that we're leading. Why? Because there's many other people out there that are going to try to get you to follow them. He says, pay attention to that. Be followers together of me. He says, mark them which walk. So as you have us for an example, we are your example. This is the way you do it. And when you see these other you know, prophets or whatever, these false prophets rising up and trying to tell you different things, bad doctrines, false doctrines, other way of doing things, he says, you need to understand. He's like, I tell you, even weeping, this is such a big deal. There are people all throughout history have been trying to say, oh, Satan is always bringing an attack against godly men and he is always trying to pervert the truth and make sure that, that people don't realize what the truth is so that they could just believe in lies. And that's why you know, the, you know, Satan is an angel of light and his devils that, that, that serve him are also come across as, as you know, angels of light. They look like they're good. They look like they're these good people, these great preachers, right? And they're wicked. And we need to be aware of that. So when you, got, when, you, when you found a good godly man to follow, follow him as they follow Christ. You're in 1 Peter chapter 5. Because a good pastor is someone that you should follow. A good pastor is a good leader, but not a lord over the flock. We'll see that in 1 Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. The elders which are among you I exhort. This is, this is from Peter, right? The apostle Peter who am also an elder. Peter was a pastor of a church. He was an elder. An elder is another name for a pastor. They're used synonymously in the Bible. And I've got to prove that to you tonight. Look it up for yourself. Elder, bishop, pastor are all words that are used synonymously for the same office. Peter was an elder, he says, and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse number two, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So now he's exhorting, you know, elders. He's exhorting the elders which are among them. That's what verse number one. He's saying, look, you need to feed the flock of God. You need to be teaching doctrine. You need to be teaching the Bible, feeding them giving them the things that they need from God's word. And he says, take the oversight thereof, take the oversight of the church, look over the things, not by constraint, not because you have to, not because, oh man, this is my job, I got to do this. He says, but willingly. You should want to take the oversight and to, feed, you know, and to care for these people and want to do that. And he says, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. He's saying, not for money, you don't just take this job because you want the money. He says, but you have a ready mind. You're ready to, to, to feed the people, to care for the flock, and to look over. I mean, that's what a pastor does, right? It, 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 it's, it's associated with, with being a pastor of sheep out in the field, in a pasture. You're the pastor over this, over this flock, and you're, you're watching over their well-being and their safety. Well, in the church, it's similar. You're looking over the well-being and the safety of all the church members as a pastor. Now, it says, you could say there, oh, well, this is not, uh, not for, uh, for filthy lucre, so the pastor shouldn't get paid. And I just preached on this about a week ago. No, that's not true, and, and I'm not going to go over all the details on that. The position is completely legitimately a paid position. But the, what he's saying here, you don't take this position for the money. It's your motivation. What are you preaching for? I didn't take this job of pastoring Word of Truth Baptist Church for the money. Because first of all, because there is no money that I'm getting paid right now, anyways. But regardless of that, even if you know, because one day I will be getting paid. You know, Lord willing, will be a big enough church to sustain me to be full time, 100% all my time that I have to spend working devoted to serving this church. But that is not the reason why I'm doing this at all. It's to serve God, it's to help people, it's to lead people to Christ. That's the whole point. And that's what a good pastor is, is their motivation. It's not about the money, it's not because you have to do this. 
It's willingly something that you're doing. You're offering yourself up as a living sacrifice unto God to do the work that He has for you. Verse number three. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Very important verse. You know, the pastor should not be, and, and I've known people like this where they're really controlling over their congregation. And he's saying, you're not the Lord. You're to be an example. You are to be the example. You know, I'm going to go off and show you, that, hey, this is how we do it. But at the end of the day, it's up to you. I'm not lording over you. I'm not going to dictate what you can and can't do when you leave this church and you go home and you live your life. Hey, I'm going to preach God's word to you so that there's no question about it, so that there's no, oh man, I don't know, is this a sin or not? I'll preach it to you. But then the choice is you to make those decisions. We don't have a, a rule book that you have to sign to be a member of our church, as some churches have. That's lording over the flock. Look, that's between you and God. And this is the way that a pastor ought to lead, is by leading by example. Nobody wants to follow a guy that just blows off his mouth but doesn't do anything. No one has respect for the boss. I mean, think about at work. Has anyone ever had a boss that's, you know, they're, they're all day going to hound on you to do things, but then like they just sit, kick their feet up and don't do anything? Nobody wants to work for a guy like that. Th that's the type of person where the guys will work is while they're looking, and then as soon as he's gone, they don't care. They have no respect. But the, but the guy that's out there busting his hump and working, and, and the guys can see that, that, that are working for him, they can see, man, this guy's putting in all these hours. He's working real hard. They have respect for that so that when he says, hey, I need you guys to do this, usually they'll, they'll, they'll jump and do it because that's a good leader. That's a good leadership. Also one that's willing to serve, not just be a master or a lord. Someone who says, hey, what can I do for you? How can I help you make your job get better, right? And, and, and the leader will be able to do that for his workers. How can I make things better for you? What do we need to do? All right, here you go. I'm going off to do this now. That's a good leader, and that's someone you should have no problems being able to follow. Being a follower of man is not, is not always a bad thing. We'll keep reading here in verse number 4, 1 Peter 5. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So of the good, the, the, the good examples to the flock, the good elders, the good pastors, he said, if you're doing a good job, when, when Christ comes back, the chief shepherd, because we're just under shepherds, under, you know, under pastors, we have an authority over us, of course, the chief shepherd. You says you'll receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger... Submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he, might, he may exalt you in due time. Following someone else requires a degree of humility. And oftentimes these people that'll just, oh, I'm not, I don't want to follow some man or listen to what some man has to say. Why? It's because they're proud. They're so lifted up and full of themselves that they don't want to listen to what anyone else has to say. Now, one of the reasons that you should listen to a pastor, or at least someone who's a pastor following Christ, is because in order to even have this position biblically, if someone follows the biblical model, they're not a novice. This isn't something new to them. It's someone who's been proven to have an education in God's Word, someone who's studied God's Word, someone who's done the work, and has been an example and has proven themselves to be faithful. They've been faithful in their own household. They've been able to raise their children and, and, and have their wife be obedient unto them and to be able to, to, to lead in all of these different ways. That is the person that becomes ordained to be a pastor of a church. At least that's the way it ought to be. Biblically speaking, that is the way it ought to be done, which is another reason why you should be able to look up to a pastor and say, you know what, there's a man I can follow. There's someone I should be able to learn from. And people get, especially, man, with the internet these days, I, I, I'm a computer programmer. I work with the internet and stuff, but there's so much garbage out there. And I'm not just total anti-internet, but we really got to be careful. People, people could get so haughty and so lifted up because they read these articles or see these videos and they think they have so much knowledge. No one else knows this, but, you know, this guy's got it right and everyone else is wrong. And you get this air of arrogance 
thinking that everyone else is an idiot. And you got to check yourself with that. Especially when you're dealing with people who aren't idiots, that, that aren't just not knowledgeable in the Word. It, it's funny how many comments we get on YouTube. And it's not like we have some, you know, thousands of views or anything like that on all the videos. It's, it's a small number. But the people that blow off their mouth, even when, you know, and I, I'm not lift myself up, but I'm in this position for a reason. I don't, you know, it's not like I've never read this. You know, people say, oh, what, haven't you ever read? You know, it's like, yeah, I have read that. It's not, you know, anyways, I'm not, I'm not going to get off on that rabbit trail. Being able to follow a man is, and I'm not saying I'm right all the time either. Or, or above rebuke. Because I'm not. But there ought to be some recognition of the work that's being done when someone's following, dedicating their life to follow God and, and teaching and doing all these things and all the time that's spent to, to recognize that and how you communicate with somebody else too and be able to communicate tactfully. But not everyone has faith. Hebrews 13, 7. You don't have to turn there. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So according to Hebrews 13, 7, there are people that have the rule over you because in the church, there is a, a position, there's an ordained, ordained bishop that, that has the rule over you. It says, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That's what it's talking about. The people have the rule over you. Who have spoken unto you the word of God. The preacher that's preaching the word of God has the rule over you. It says, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And then down in verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And he's saying, look, submit yourselves. Be humble unto the person that has the rule over you who's teaching you the word of God. Why? Because they're watching out for you. They're looking out for your souls. And actually, they're going to be partially responsible for your souls. You read in Ezekiel about the watchmen. And God says, hey, if you fail to warn the people, you know, judgment's going to come upon them, but their blood will I require at your hands. And every pastor of churches, of, of, of their church, is responsible for the congregation and the flock that they are watching over for their well-being. And that is a responsibility, which again, I have an invest, a vested value in you in the congregation here, because God's going to be looking at me saying, hey, you're not doing your job right. There's people in your church, and you know that there's in, you're not warning them about it. It's going to come down on me. I need to be aware of this. You know, I need to be able to teach completely without worrying about, oh, who am I going to offend? No, I'm, instead of worrying about offending, I'm going to be like, what do we need to get right here? Because I don't want to miss any of it because I want to do the job that God has called me to do here. And I am going to be held accountable for the things that I preach and the things that I say and for you. And that's one of the reasons why the Bible is saying here to obey them and have the rule over you and submit yourselves because they're watching over you, because they're trying to help you. We don't want to be divisive and inside of our church and, and, and you know, getting proud and lifting up, oh, I'm not going to follow that man. It's not the way it ought to be because they're looking out for you. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11. And this is all going to tie in here with this whole concept of being humble and not being rebellious. That's why it's no mistake that the very first two verses he's talking about, hey, be a follower of me because this next topic we're going to get into about the length of your hair and stuff has a lot to do with rebellion. It has a lot to do with dishonoring the head and not being obedient, not humbling yourself, and not submitting yourself. Verse number three, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So what's he doing here? He's establishing an authority structure, right? Talking about the head. He's not talking about a physical head, although he will in a minute. We're going to go over that. 
He's saying the head. What's the head? The boss, right? So basically, you have God at the top, and then Christ, because this is the head of Christ is God. He says the head of every man is Christ. You have God, Christ, man, and then the head of the, of the woman is man in the authority structure of who's the boss. It starts off, he says, um, you know, again, the head of every man is Christ. Every man here today, Christ is your boss. And the head of the woman is the man. So the wives, hey, your husband's the boss. He is your head. He's the person that you go to as the man. You know, and that's perfect illustration. Follow me as I follow Christ to the wife. You're their head. You're their leader. You are their boss. And Christ is your boss, man, that you need to be following him and being that example for your wife. So you say, you know, all these verses you read to begin with, you're talking about pastors and all this other stuff. Well, look, if you're married, you've got someone under your authority. You don't have to be the pastor of a church to be able to follow the same concept. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And actually, keep a finger in Genesis We've got a few places we're, um, we're going we're gonna to turn back there again or keep a bookmark there or something. I've got a little bit later in the sermon, we've got a few more references to Genesis as we cover the material here tonight. Genesis 3.16, the Bible reads, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Look at this. In thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. This is after the sin in the Garden of Eden. This was a curse of God. And he's saying, look, this is the way it's going to be now. Your husband is going to have the rule over you. And this is something now that, that wasn't just for Adam and Eve, but has transcended all time. It's, gone, it, it's something that has passed on as the authority structure, which was confirmed here in 1 Corinthians 11.3, who said the head of every woman is the man. In Genesis 3, we can find the root of that, the, the, the first instance of this happening where God has proclaimed that the husband rules the wife. Now, we get different images in our head about, oh, he shall rule over thee. And you think of like ruling with an iron fist, right? That's kind of the, what the thought that people want, that the world is going to want to have come into your mind. That you're just this horrible, fascist, authoritarian dictator that doesn't want anyone to be happy and it's just all about me you just serve me and that's not you know you can rule meaning you are in charge and you are delegating you're telling the way things are going to be without being a jerk <laughs> bottom line you don't have to be a fascist dictator in order to rule well i mean some people don't rule well and others do but you want to be a good leader and but at the bottom line, I don't want to soften it up too much because the husband, the Bible says the husband is the ruler of the house. So ladies, you should be able to remember that. And what the, if your husband's telling you to do something, what he says goes in that house according to God. And when you disobey your husband, you're disobeying God because he's the one that said that your husband's going to rule over you. The only exception to that rule would be if your husband's telling you to do something that God said not to do. Because God is higher in the authority chain. Christ is the head of the man. So if Christ says to do one thing and your husband says to do something different, Christ supersedes the authority of the husband in that situation, which is why he lays out the structure this way. However, if your husband tells you to do something and it's not against the Bible, but you say, well, why does he want me to do that? Like if, I, if I told my wife... Go, go get my shoes and bring them to me, right? Whatever. I mean, it's something real silly. It doesn't matter. Well, I'm not your slave. What do you want? You're actually the servant. I didn't say you're a slave, but you're the, you, know, you are the servant. You are, you are under obedience. You ought to be in subjection to your husband so that there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't go get shoes for your husband. Or, you know, I mean, it's just not in there. It's not a sin. You're not breaking any of God's commandments. So if your husband tells you to do something like that, then you do it. And let that run. I mean, take that and apply that to every other example in the house. And the Bible also says the husbands love your wives. 
All right, and, and, and treat them, give honor unto them as, as unto the weaker vessel. You know that they're, that they're weaker and we ought to love them as Christ loved the church and he gave himself for it. You know, we ought to be doing everything in our power to, you know, to, to, to be caring for our, for our spouse, for our wives. But we need to get this mentality right because in 2016, people almost think you're like from another world. When you, when I, like when I tell people that like I'm in charge of my house, because people are always making jokes, oh, what are you going to go ask the boss? Like, no, I'm actually the boss in my house. I don't even joke with that because I don't think it's funny. I don't think that, that saying something that is completely opposite of what God ordained is a joke. I don't think that's funny at all. I, I don't think we should be having foolish jesting about God's word and what he ordained. Joke about all kinds of other things that don't matter, but don't joke about something like that. Because people, it's, it's a half joke. Because in many marriages and many families, that is the way things work. Well, I don't want my wife to get mad. Well, who's the boss? Because God said that you're the boss and you're not being a very good leader or ruler of their house if you're letting your wife usurp your authority in that, in that home. If God had wanted your wife to be the ruler, he would have said so in the Bible. But that's not the way that he wanted it. So you're sinning against God, husband, when you let your wife take control of the house. Don't do that. It, I mean, things get screwed up that way. We have, think about it even in terms of our, of our current government, right? There was a separation of powers when it was designed. And it was designed that way for good reason. You have the Congress, you have the President, and you have the courts, right? And all this was dividing the power so that no one was supposed to be able to get too powerful and, and start just being more too authoritarian. But what do we have now? We have a Congress that's just letting the executive branch do everything and take over the jobs that they're supposed to do. They're the ones that's failing. Hey, if the president's going to try to do those things, they need to step in and say, no, that is our job and our responsibility. And you can see how screwed up things are getting because now we're starting to get more of a dictator as a president instead of, you know, a servant that's, that's, that's the... Um, just executing, being the executive branch, the, the um, execution of the laws that are created through Congress. Now we have presidents that want to create the laws and judge the laws and do the whole thing. And things get screwed up. And when that happens in the home, things get screwed up. Because there's a very good reason for the way that God designed them. Uh, you can turn if you want to, to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, continuing on the same concept of the, of the authority structure because, you know, Christ, or in 1 Corinthians 11, it gave the authority of, of God and Christ and man and woman being that authority. We're going to see it's actually a curse unto the land when women are ruling, when they're the ones in charge. Isaiah 3, chapter number 3, verse number 7 is where we're going to start reading. Isaiah 3, 7 says, In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So Jerusalem and Judah, this is their fall and their ruin. They're in such a state that people don't want to be the ruler over that. People are like, I don't want that mess. It's kind of the way the United States is getting right now. We are like, I don't want the job. I don't want these jobs because it's in such a big mess. I don't want to deal with that. But let's keep reading. And, and the reason why it says that they're ruined is because their tongue, the things that they say and the things that they do are against the Lord. That's why they're in ruins, and that's why this country is, is in ruins. It's because the things that, that, that this country as a whole and our culture, the things that we say and the things that we do, they're against the Lord. They're wicked. They're abominable. Verse 9, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Oh, boy. Isn't that the truth that's going on here? I mean, 
What more? I mean, this always just comes to my mind when I read these verses. They declare their sin as Sodom. Sodom was not embarrassed or ashamed at all of their sin. They were out in public with it. In fact, they were so out about it, they came and surrounded Lot's house and just bring those men out to us. They weren't ashamed that they were filthy faggots. They weren't ashamed of that like they should have been, hiding in the closet, being scared that someone might find out that they're a homo. Instead, they're out and proud about it. The way that people are, are today in this country, marching up and down the streets, being out and proud, accept us. And they never stop. They're implacable. They're unmerciful, according to Romans chapter 1. This is the state that Jerusalem and Judah was in at this time. They're saying, look, they... they they show of their countenance that the witness against them. They declare their sin as They hide it not. We're in verse 9. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Look at verse number 12. As for my people, my people, again, we're, we're in reference to Jerusalem and Judah, the people of God, right? the people of Israel at this time. As for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. That's a curse from God because they have gotten so wicked and, and so perverted that now all of a sudden children are oppressing them. Which is happening today. Think about all the divorced homes and, and, the, and the parents that the kids are now dictating what's going to happen because they want to win over the affection of their child over their ex-spouse. And the children up ruling in the house and just, just saying, you know, they basically become the oppressors. Get me this or get me that or I'll, you know, and some kids, go, you know, I'll call CPS, I'll do this and, and, and try to usurp that authority and the parents are giving into it. Instead of getting out the belt and saying, yeah, right, go ahead and call CPS and treating them as a child and being a good, loving parent to that child that needs correction, instead of letting them be the oppressor in the household, it says, and women rule over them. Now, if women are in the rule, in, the rule, in verse 12, let's, you know, the second pass, half of that verse says, O my people, they which lead thee, who are, who's that? The women that are ruling over them cause thee to err. They cause you to, to be in error, to make mistakes, to do things wrong and destroy the way of thy paths. God did not ordain for the woman to usurp authority over the man, but the man is to be in charge. That's the authority structure. 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives us a lot of the, the qualifications of a, of a bishop. And it says in verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house. Right, I mentioned I brought this up earlier. Someone who's, who's going to be a, a, a good pastor is going to rule his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Gravity is seriousness. They need to be able to say, hey, get your feet out of there. Be in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? This is one of the requirements. They say, look, if you can't even rule like a few people you know, in your own household, your own family, your own flesh and blood children, how are you going to manage and take care of all of the other people in the church that are not even related to you if you can't get your own family to listen to you and respect you and obey you? And then in verse number 12, it talks about the deacons have the same, the same qualifications. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. It's not just talking about the children. It says, and their own houses, which includes their wife. They're ruling their children and their houses well. And if they have servants or whatever, because many people did, you know, if you, whatever, you're ruling your whole house. Whatever falls in your house well, that is part of the qualifications for being a bishop or a deacon. Now, to this point, we've gone over a lot of scripture regarding authority and, you know, and people ruling. And if you aren't offended by the preaching yet, you're doing a good job. All right, you're hanging there with me. But this next part is actually what gets a lot of people upset. I know the, the part about women being <laughs> subjected to their husband gets a lot of people upset too. But this, it, it's, it's really funny. Well, let's, let's, let's read it. Let's read, uh, go back to 1 Corinthians 11. Because now we're getting into the section that's talking about, it's going to literally talk about the length of our hair. And 
before we even start reading this, you're going to notice the word covering over and over again. Covered, covered. You know, a man be covered, a woman be covered, or uncovered. There's a false belief out there where people will believe this is talking about a literal covering like a fabric, like a hat or a bonnet. And there are some churches, even some Baptist churches, where the women wear head coverings because they think that that's what 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about. My friend, people that believe that, I mean, I, the only conclusion I come up with is that they're lost. That they have blinders on that are so deep that they just, they just can't understand the truth. Now, I won't make a blanket statement and say every single person that wears a head covering isn't saved. I don't know. I mean, they could just be very deceived. But to not see this from the Bible, we're going to, because we'll go back through it, but look, just jump ahead, if you would, to verse number 15. Verse 15 says, But if a woman have long hair, Hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. We read all this stuff, and, and as we go through it again, you'll see it's talking about a covering, a covering, a covering. He defines, the Bible defines the covering as being her hair, and not just that. When we're looking at these coverings, it's being contrasted with being shaven or shorn. Why would it be talking about shaven or shorn if it's talking about a head covering garment? It doesn't make any sense. You don't shave a hat or a bonnet. You shave your hair. And it says directly, I mean, just right in the scripture, it's so, it couldn't be more clear. The hair is given for a covering. But let's, let's go back a little bit here and look at verse number four. The Bible says, Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. And I know we jumped around a lot, but verse 3 was the verse that said that the head of every man is Christ. Right? So I, I, we kind of went way off for a while, but coming back to this, from verse 3 that says the head of every man is Christ to verse 4 that says that every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonoreth his head. It's not talking about, the first part is talking about his physical head, having his head covered, dishonors his head, which is Christ. Now that, that covering, as, and I wanted to point out from the beginning, is talking about his hair. So if a man has a lot of hair and he's praying or prophesying, it says that's a dishonor to Christ, to his head. Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. Now, who does it dishonor if the wife basically has short hair for if her head is uncovered? It dishonors her head, but who's her head? The man. Her husband, right? That's a dishonor unto him if she's doing that. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, why would that be thrown in there? Again, if it's, if it's talking about a hat, well, if she doesn't have a hat, she might as well just be shaven. No. If she has shorter hair, we might as well just shave it all off. And we'll see that in a minute here. Verse number six. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Let me ask you this today now, just in general. How many women do you know that would be just completely fine with having their head just completely shaven down? Because I don't know any. The ones that I've known that have had their hair shaved, people like, I know women that have had chemotherapy, cancer treatments, have had other you know, medicines and things that made their hair fall out. Every single one that I know of has done something to cover up their head because they're embarrassed, because it's a shame. And this is very much true today. So he says, okay, if you don't want to be covered, then be shorn. Just shave it all right down. That's your option as a woman. But if it's a shame to be shorn or shaven, which it is, let her be covered. So he's saying, then keep the covering. Verse number seven, for if a man indeed ought not to cover his head, 
For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, you, I told you to keep a place in Genesis, right? Go back to Genesis 1. Because God was created in, God, or God created man in his image. He didn't create woman in his image. We are the image of God. So man shouldn't have his head covered with a lot of hair because we are in God's image, which means God doesn't have his head covered with a lot of hair. Prior, you know, contrary to what people will believe these days, thinking that Jesus Christ had this real long hair. We just, we're out soul winning and we talk to him and say, well, Jesus had long hair. So how do you know that? Some artist depicted Jesus you know, a thousand years after he's already been on his earth of having long hair, and the artist was a sodomite. Just because some pervert put long hair on Jesus doesn't mean it, but that's what the world accepts. What do you see? They, they, they depict a man wearing a dress and having long hair, and they say that that's Jesus, and that's blasphemous. But that's what the world accepts as the image of Christ. The Bible says in, in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. What's an image? It's a picture. It's a likeness, right? So God created us in his image. We are a likeness of God. You want to know what God looks like? He looks kind of like a man because we're created in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Do men and women look the same? No. There's a difference. There's pretty significant differences. Man was created in God's image. And that's what it says. If you could go back real quick to 1 Corinthians 11. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Of, you know, oftentimes the Bible usually it means from. The woman came from the man. The, wo the man didn't come from the woman. The woman came from the man. Back in Genesis, again, verse number, or chapter 2, Genesis 2, verse 21 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Woman was created. Eve was created out of man. That's why it says here that man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. The man came first. God created man in his own image, and then later he created woman out of man. And why did he do that? He created her to be a help. Look at verse number 18 of chapter 2, Genesis 2. Genesis 2.18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So first, God creates man on the earth. And then he says, You know what? I don't think man should be alone. He needs a helper. He needs someone to help him do the things that I want him to do. And he created all these animals, but none of them were proper, a proper helper for him. And think about that. I mean, we've got animals, oxes and bulls and you know, animals, horses and mules and that can do, that can help a man. But they weren't sufficient, of a sufficient help for him. And then he creates a woman that came from, hey, you know, this is bone in my bone and flesh in my flesh. And back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 9, he says, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The whole reason why God created a woman was for the man. Again, let's get our doctrine straight. Let's get our mindset straight in this twisted and corrupted world of the gender roles of men and women. Now, I don't care if the world wants to call me sexist and think I'm crazy and nuts and old-fashioned, whatever. I don't care because what I care about is what God's Word says. And this is how I'm going to live my life. And this is how I run my family. And you know what? You will be much happier if you follow things God's way, whether you're the wife or whether you're the husband. Husbands, rule your family well. Take that authority and that responsibility and take the oversight of your family. Be responsible for them. Love them. Care for them. Make the right decisions. You have a lot of weight and a lot of responsibility on you to do what's right. 
And you have to work at it and work hard for it. And don't be lazy and just expect it to be one of these bosses that doesn't do anything, but just likes to tell everyone else what to do. Your family won't respect you if you're like that. But if they see that you're a hard worker, they see that you're serving God, and then you tell them to do something, you know what? They're going to listen to you. And wives, don't think you're going to be happier if you're the one in charge. Well, might as well just do things my way. Everything would be a lot better. No, it wouldn't. Because that's not the way that God made it. You might not be able to even comprehend that. But just understand enough to know that do you really want to fight against the way God made things? Do you want to pervert the, the, the way that God designed it or not? Do you want to be in obedience to Christ? Ephesians chapter 5 says that the, the wife needs to be obedient to her husband in all things. Even as the church is subject unto Christ in the same way, in, in everything. The way that this whole church needs to be in submission to Jesus Christ, that's the way that the wife needs to be with her husband. And you will have a happy marriage if you live that way. God will bless you for it. and it, He doesn't even have to bless you overtly. It's inherently designed in the structure. God has designed men to lead and women to be submissive. And to be that will make you better at your role and more fulfilling in your life in general. There is joy that I continue to receive. You know, for years I lived, I lived the life for me. For my pleasure, for my you know, living in sin, doing all these things. You know, people, that the world's going to tell you, oh, that's great, man. You're single. You're going out and doing this and trying that and doing all these other things and, and living a wicked life, that's misery. It's miserable. It's a facade of, of happiness and joy. That's not real fun. You get the true joy and happiness in your life when you start doing what God has intended for you to do. I didn't understand happiness until I started serving the Lord I got married, I got a great wife, a great family, and we start living the way, you know, as close as possible to the way that God laid it out here. I'm trying to be the best leader I can. My wife's trying to be the best wife that she can. And praise the Lord. That is true joy and happiness. Let's finish up here. We're almost done. Look, look at verse number 10. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head. Because of the angels. Now, and I will admit to you right now, I don't know exactly what this verse is talking about. Okay? I've talked to a lot of people about this verse. And this one's kind of, kind of a struggle for me. So I'm, I'm just going to skip that one. Let's go to verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Ask yourself this. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? He's saying, look, this is inherent in our nature. Doesn't he, you know, God built us with these consciences in nature. Like, doesn't, doesn't even just strike you as weird just naturally that it's weird for a man. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Well, you look like a girl. What are you doing walking around with that long hair? You look like a woman. Go cut your hair. Look like a man for crying out loud. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Praise the Lord for women have long hair. That's what it was designed for. For her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now people say, oh, well, if someone's you know, contentious about it, then, you know, it's, no. You don't just say, oh, it's okay then for you. We're going to contend for the faith, and if someone's contentious, see, people who are disobedient, they're going to be contentious. They're the ones that you find, like, I mean, think about all this talking about authority, and I think it's really interesting that those that are rebellious completely disregard this teaching from the Bible. I think it's interesting, too, how many people have never even heard of this before. We're, it's the same lady we were talking to last week out soul winning. And I brought up, the, I said, well, I was trying to explain our church. So we went out, we preached the gospel. This lady was a Catholic lady. And first I was like, I was, I was 
give another gospel. You know, first she just said it's total works, and then I just kind of said, well, we believe. I showed her some scripture and stuff, and then she was one of those like real agreeable, like, oh yeah, well that's what I believe, you know. But not probably not just fully comprehending it. You know, I tried to get, do as much as possible, and then she was going on about how there was. She's been to other churches and Baptist churches, and she's she really doesn't like them because they make up all these rules and all this other stuff. I said, well. You know, we don't have rules per se, but I do teach things because she was going on about all, you know, they tell you not to do this and not to do that. And, all, you know, and I, part of the problem is probably because they tell you not to do things, but they don't teach you why. They don't teach you the Bible and, and say, well, this is why. And I said, well, I don't want you to have a, you know, because I'm inviting her to church still, even though she didn't get to, you know, just, just come up. I would like to, I would love to have an opportunity to talk to her again, to give her the gospel again. But, um, I said, I, I, I'd also don't, I don't hide who we are. So I teach on a lot of things, but out of the Bible, I'll teach on things. And I said, well, for example, right? And I went to 1 Corinthians 11. I said, this, this is a great example of something that people could get upset by. Because they say, oh, God doesn't care how I look. Well, if God doesn't care how you look, then why is this in the Bible? If God doesn't care how long your hair is, why is this in the Bible? Why does he say it's a dishonor? Why does he say it's a shame for a man to have long hair? Why, why is it even in there if God doesn't care at all about how long your hair is? It wouldn't be in there unless he does care. And, I, and I've showed her. I, should, I just plain, she's like, at first she, she was thinking I was talking about chapter 13, which is a charity chapter, which is, you know, a lot of people love. She said, oh, I love that chapter. I'm like, yeah, I don't think you love this chapter. But <laughs> I, I went over it with her and she's like, after she had already said how many times she's read the Bible and everything else, she said, oh, I've never seen that before. And the reason why is because most people, they're not, I mean, they may pick up their Bible and read some psalm, or read a proverb, or read a, a gospel, or so, you know, something like that, but they don't go through and read the Bible cover to cover. Which is why, and, and churches don't teach on this. They don't, because they don't want people getting upset. They just skip over it. Nah, we don't have to deal, we'll, we'll, we'll always deal with the second half of, of chapter 11. We don't have to go to the first half. Why? Because so many women these days have really short hair and so many men these days have really long hair and when you start preaching that, people get upset. They get angry. They don't want to be reproved or rebuked. They don't want to be told they're wrong. And you think about, now, again, it's one of those things I, I preached on uh, recently on, on uh, the values in the American culture in the 1950s and how vastly different it is from today. And it's not even that long ago. I mean, in 1950s, it was 60 years ago, right? I mean, not, not, not hundreds of years ago, not like this super foreign era. I mean, people are still alive that grew up in the 50s today. Like, you could talk to these people. It's not so far removed. And back then, generally, by and large, what was accepted in society is women had long hair and men had short hair. As was evidenced because in the 60s is when you started to get the, you know, the 60s rock and roll and the hippie movement. And what was the hippie movement? The long hairs, right? I mean, that's what they were called, the long hairs. That was a label given to them. Why? Because up to that point, it hadn't been acceptable and it still wasn't of, for men to have long hair. So they're like, those are the long hairs. Those are these hippies. And what goes along with that? The rock and roll. Think about rock and roll in the 60s. The long-haired guys were rebels. They were rebels. They didn't want it. Oh, I don't want to have anything to do with authority. I don't want to have anything to do with structure. I don't want to have anything to do with the church or God or anything. I'll show you. I'm going to grow my hair out long. And the rock music has that spirit. Music has a spirit. I believe that's, it's of the devil. The rock and roll is of the devil. All the worldly music is of the devil. And they all carry their own spirit. And the rock and roll is a total spirit of rebellion. And I mean, the songs are all about it. You know, I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, the parents and the school and, I, and, and any, any semblance of authority. And what do they do? They grow their hair out long. Dishonoring, disrespecting their head, which is Christ. Because they don't perceive him as an authority in their life. I mean, I think about the, if I think about the stereotypical loud, obnoxious woman that won't listen to their husband, first thought that comes to mind is this really short hair. Pants wearing, short hair woman that's just going to tell you and be the leader and the boss. And the way. That is not the way God ordained it. 
And that's just a sign of the rebellion against God. The, sh the sign of the lack of humility to submit yourself to the God-ordained authority. Don't let people tell you God doesn't care about how we look. Otherwise, this, one, this, this scripture wouldn't exist. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for the clear teachings from the Bible, dear Lord. It, it so boggles my mind that people can't understand the simple truth uh, about the length of our hair. But um, the only thing that comes to my mind is that the blinders are just truly on, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to reach the lost and to, to bring salvation to them, bring the light of the gospel to them, dear Lord, and not just to get them saved, but to disciple them and, and to teach them and train them in, in your word, dear God. I pray that you please help me as a pastor to be a good leader, dear Lord, to lead by example, to do the right thing so that I could, could honestly say with a, with a good conscience that, that I want the people here to follow me that the way that I'm following you, dear Lord, help me to, to continue to do more for you. I pray that you please help everyone here tonight to do more for you, to be diligent to understand and to read the Bible on their own, dear Lord, that they, they might not be deceived by the, the false prophets that are out there, but that they could all um, follow their leader as, as, we, as they follow Christ, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.